Welcome to worship at St. Paul's Lutheran Church here on Homecoming Sunday. All of the fall programming gets off and running today, as well as our youth programming last Wednesday night. Today we also introduce to you four strategic priorities that St. Paul's will be pursuing in the months ahead. Please listen for those in the sermon today, and we would like to hear what you think and how you might like to get involved and support. Now, let us join in worship. us pray. Grant us, O Lord, to trust in you with all our hearts, for as you always resist the proud who confide in their own strength, so you never forsake those who make their boast of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 15th chapter. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. 
And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate the gospel of the Lord. How many of you could recite the mission statement of St. Paul's Lutheran Church? Anybody? Don't feel bad. I worked here for five years before I really took any notice of it at all. Did we even have a mission statement? I knew what our values were. I knew the things I liked about this church were grounded in tradition, were guided by intellect, were growing in faith. But I only had a vague sense of what our mission was. I hope today we can begin to change that. That every St. Paul's person could recite our mission, explain what it means, and feel in their souls why it matters. To help, we printed a condensed version of the mission statement. You can pull it out. It's in the insert in your announcement booklet. Go ahead. I invite you if you want to take it out. Also on there is a vision statement and four strategic priorities. We'll get to all that a little later in the sermon. Mostly just stick with me on that mission statement. It's the foundation. With no mission, we have no purpose. So let's stick there for a while. There it says, in a nice script, our mission at St. Paul's is to affirm our worth is a divine gift and not a human achievement. Does that make sense? It's another way of saying we are unconditionally loved by God. It matters because all too often we hear a different voice, not of God, saying you are not unconditionally loved. 
We hear a different voice saying, you are not enough. We hear it from others. We hear it from within. When we compare ourselves to others. Years ago, I was sitting in my office speaking with a gentleman who heard that voice all around him. You are not enough. He struggled with guilt as a parent, never felt like he was enough. Same as a spouse, was always failing in some way. He struggled with addiction throughout his life. We talked about his church experience, his faith experience. He was raised in another tradition, one that left him feeling like he was not enough, not only in the eyes of others, but also in the eyes of God. He said to me, he looked at me, he said, Pastor, I've got to shake this shame thing. And with that mission statement in mind, I told him, well, I think you found the right church. Here, we affirm that our worth is a divine gift, not a human achievement. He heard me say that, and instantly his expression changed. It was like a transfiguration before my eyes. I love that, he said. I've never heard that from a church before. Our mission matters because there are thousands of people who've never heard that from a church before. That message which secures our inner foundation. That's why it matters. David Brooks wrote a great essay last month. It was called Grow Up America. And in it, he wrote, the best life is a series of daring explorations launched from a secure base. The best life is a series of daring explorations launched from a secure base. I believe the most secure base in the cosmos is the affirmation that our worth is a divine gift and not a human achievement. The base that we are unconditionally loved by God. That as the starting place. When that's our secure base, we can launch and fly into any sense of calling or purpose or mission, and we can launch and fail. We can work hard and walk the narrow path, and we can find ourselves walking astray, screwing up, and always fall back on the grace of God. If our mission statement had a story, it would be the story of the prodigal son. If only the church kept repeating that upsetting, ridiculous story. It's an upsetting, ridiculous story, just like that Deuteronomy we text, text we heard about canceling debts every seven years. That's ridiculous. As ridiculous as that message in grace in Ephesians that we've been saved by grace. And there in Luke, an undeserving child betrays his parent, lives irredeemably, comes groveling back, and rather than punishment, the parent throws a party. I didn't read that second half, but most of you know it, about the other brother and his feelings about watching what just went down with the little brother. That good child stayed home, did everything right. He can only watch and get really angry. The late pastor Timothy Keller wrote that Jesus' purpose in that parable is not to warm our hearts, but to shatter our categories. We want to get what we deserve. 
and we want others to get what they deserve. Jesus told this parable not to warm our hearts, but to shatter our categories. Because that's how it works in the economy of God's love. Jesus knew that only unmerited love, radically given away to the least deserving people, only that kind of love could transform the world. The prodigal son got a party not because he deserved it, but because he was lost and then he was found. Because his worth is a divine gift and not a human achievement. That message, that mission, is the secure base from which we can launch, whether the good brother or the bad brother. Same base. That's what we want you to help your kids understand. That's what we want you to invite your neighbors or your friends to come and hear and experience. It is a life-changing message, like the expression on that guy's face in my office. And like him, many have never heard it from a church. No wonder millions, millions have left the church. The church forgot its story. Our own national church, it was founded in 1988, I've mentioned this before, started with 5 million members, now we have 3 million. Projections in 2050 have us at zero. Unless something changes. We've quoted up here before, the church is always one generation away from extinction. It's time to reclaim our secure base of God's love and boldly start sharing that with others. I think God still has use for the church. And I believe this church is ready to launch. You also have there in your little handout St. Paul's vision statement proposed to the council that this church would serve as a leading congregation in the region, emphasizing that message of God's unconditional love. I don't think it's a dream to claim a role as a church that's a leader in the area. We've been blessed with relative abundance. Our national church already recognizes us as a leading congregation in generosity. In southeast Pennsylvania, our pocket around here, colleagues ask, what are you all up to in Doylestown? They're looking to us to lead. They're looking for ideas, for hope. Just the other day, a former member wrote me an email. He moved to Virginia to be close to his adult daughter and grandchild. And he said, Pastor, I just started a small group ministry in our new church. And I'm starting to feel bad because I I keep saying, well, this is how we did it at St. Paul's. And I told him, if it's working, don't feel bad. He said he's partnering with the pastor there. It's being well-received. Feel good to serve as a leading congregation. How do we get there? If you want to flip to the back side, a a group of core leaders, church council, St. Paul's staff have thought this over for months. And we suggest four priorities. They're printed there for you. That first one is especially close to my heart. We worked with this consultant who, uh, she's Christian, but she mostly works with colleges and universities. I thought I might get better help from outside the church than working with some church consultant. And she was great, and she helped lead us into there. And she said, Thomas, just make sure one thing, just make sure one of your priorities gets in there. And this is the one that did. Create an invitational culture to attract and onboard new people. I'm convinced this is one of our most urgent tasks as a congregation is to flip the script on that culture of quietism, never sharing about our faith journey, our faith community. For 500 years, we had a different strategy that worked really well. Just have babies. Millions 
millions of babies. At the time, they were largely German babies or Norwegian or Swedish babies. Just keep having them, and it worked marvelously. Everybody was happy. And then we stopped having babies. And then the few babies we did have stopped going to church for legitimate reasons because we lost track of our story. If we believe in that mission that there's no more secure base in the cosmos than the promise of God's unconditional love, then we're going to have to invite people into a community where they could hear it and experience it. Of the, pri- of the four priorities, I think that one's going to be the biggest lift. I think it's going to take about five years to really kind of change the culture. We'd sooner invite a neighbor to pluck our eyebrow hairs than invite them to church. You've heard me quote, the average Lutheran invites someone to church every, how many? 27. 27 years. That was data. It's unnatural for us, but that culture's got to change into more like once every 27 days. It's worth the risk to offer that base to somebody. To help out a little bit, I'm going to offer a small group this fall where 10 or 12 of us will try to grow in our ability to invite people without making them feel ashamed and without feeling totally awkward ourselves to put an invitation out there. The second priority is communicate pathways that support spiritual formation for all. The idea from the planning group was that whether you're five years old or 85 years old, you could come here to St. Paul's and get connected and find ways to grow, not just by chance, because you happen to meet the right person, but that we would have a concrete resource Something we could hand to people like a map that said, hey, if you, if you want to learn more about the Bible, here's a place where you could land. If you want to grow in your prayer life, here's a group that does a lot of that. If you have a passion for service, check out these three opportunities to create a literal map to help them on their pathway. Third, Strengthen engagement with the community through visible acts of service. It's the song, they'll know we are Christians by our love. By the way we show up, not just at Sundays on, at 8 o'clock, but the way we show up out with our neighbors, out there with the community. We had a couple St. Paul's people who knew that this was one of our priorities. And so that's why finally, after years of talking about it, we finally created a running group for the 9-11 Heroes Run. Finally got one signed up and invites you to to join up with that. It's something that attracts thousands of our community members. How can we be visible in these places? We got t-shirts we're going to make. On the back, it's going to say, you are unconditionally loved, St. Paul's Lutheran Church. We're just going to run with that message in the community. Fourth, Modernize digital and on-site resources to promote the St. Paul's experience. This one's a little bit more technical, but to build up a social media presence, to have more video footage out there, maybe even a St. Paul's app. We'll see. It's a lot. We're going to need good ideas. We're going to need an increase to our budget to hire people to help us with this. We're going to need dozens of people with the heart and the mind to make these things happen. Just like that Travis Mannion run, joining up with that. But I know the people and the gifts are out there. If we just know where to land and where to put them. I saw it happen late last spring. A few high school students were fired up about some changes they wanted to see at the church. And so they reached out to me directly. They had gotten together during their lunch hour at school, and they put together their priorities for St. Paul's youth in the years to come. It was a full-court press. I was blown away by them. I was a little intimidated. 
They had set up this meeting with me. They came in all business-like with a PowerPoint presentation and everything. I was ready for a hostile takeover. This is how it's going to be. And then they presented their priorities, and all of them miraculously aligned, I kid you not, miraculously aligned with those presented here today. And we've been having more students involved in the planning and at the council meetings and active in the planning ever since. So next steps, I hope in the next few weeks, if you do anything, commit this mission statement to memory. Have it on your refrigerator for two months and lock it in. And if you don't understand it, ask Pastor Linders. I think he was the one who kind of wrote it 20 years ago. Ask me. Commit it to memory. The mission of our church to affirm our worth is a divine gift and not a human achievement. That we are unconditionally loved. A secure base from which to launch a life-changing promise from a life-changing God. Let us embrace this mission in the months and years to come and share its transformative power with all of those still waiting to hear it. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-blessed God, we thank you for the love wherewith you follow us all the days of our lives. We thank you that you inform our minds with your divine truth and undergird our will with your divine grace. We thank you for every evidence of your Spirit's leading and for all those little happenings which, though seeming at the time no more than chance, yet afterwards appear to us as part of your gracious desire for the education of our souls. 
Help this church not refuse your leading. Give us strength and confidence to affirm your unconditional love to our neighbors and friends. We praise you for the beauty of this mission to which you have called us and ask that you would equip us to pursue it in the days to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, we ask your blessing on all new beginnings this fall. For children in school and students acquainting themselves with new table mates or teammates. For those cautiously waiting to see if a new job is the right fit. We pray for the ministries begun this week, our adult and children's education, confirmation students and our youth group, Bless our leaders, teachers, presenters, and all those volunteers who show up to support. In all our diverse callings and new beginnings, teach us to love our neighbor above all else. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Help us, O God, to comfort those who suffer. Reassure any who are harmed by the wicked acts of others. Bring peace to all who are vulnerable frightened, despairing, or sick. We pray today for the people of Morocco as they search for survivors from the earthquake, accompany those who grieve, and strengthen those who respond. Be with all in need, especially those we name before you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Be our hope, O God. Remember those, we remember those whom we have loved and lost. Hear us as we name them before you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we are bold to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.